Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 16. We're glad you guys made it here. How you doing tonight, Kenny? I'm doing very well. How about you? I'm doing good, man. Always glad to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited for this episode. I've been building it up all week. All day, I'm so nervous for this episode, uh, but I, you know, I was very excited for it as well. So I hope, uh, you know, hope we do a good job. Definitely, this is this is a pretty interesting one for anyone who hasn't heard of the case. Um, but before we get started, just want to shout out our social media. You guys can look us up on Facebook, Twitter. We just made an Instagram, so we have we now have an Instagram as well as YouTube. And uh, what else, Kenny? Uh, well, our email is the Strangeland Podcast at gmail dot com, and our website is uh, strangelandpod dot com. Uh, so, just you know, if you have anything that you want to say, if you just want to talk to us or whatever, just send us an email or check out the website. Yeah, and uh, a little bit more housekeeping here, but um, just wanted to give a special shout out to everybody who's listening to the show. Uh, we've gotten emails and a lot of nice words from you guys, so we appreciate the support. Definitely. So tonight we're talking about Diane Schuler and the 2009 Taconic State Parkway crash. It's a car crash. It was a it was an automobile accident, and it really wasn't an accident. At least some people will argue that, and others will argue. Um, one very small group of people will argue. Uh, that it was an accident and that nothing, you know, nothing malicious really went down. And this this was something that was such a big deal when it first happened. And it was very sad. This, this whole case is very sad to me. I mean, honestly, I'll say this is the one case that kind of made me tear up a little bit, uh, I think, so far um, while I was researching it. And it was pretty hard to research. And the crash happened in in the town of Mount Pleasant, New York, on Sunday, July 26th, 2009. It was around 1.30 in the afternoon. It was a head-on collision that involved three cars in total, but of course, a head-on collision. There were two main cars um, in this collision. Uh, so we're talking about a maroon 2003 Ford Windstar minivan and a silver 2004 Chevy Trailblazer. The Windstar minivan hit the Trailblazer head-on, and the Trailblazer then hit a third car, uh, which was a silver 2002 Chevy Tracker. And so, like I said, this is a head-on collision. That means that, and this was on a highway. This was a highway collision. Yeah, damn near 80 miles per hour Mm -hmm. almost. And so how that is possible is one car was driving on the wrong side of the road. And so this was, it's, this is not, like I said, this is not a regular accident, like someone loses control of their car and crashes into four or five people. Uh, this was, this is a very special accident. It was not, you know, your just regular everyday highway car crash. You know, what also makes this case sort of special is that uh, it involved a 36-year-old by the name of Diane Schuler, which you mentioned earlier. Her two children, uh, a five-year-old Brian and her two-year-old Aaron, also in the minivan were Diane's three young nieces, eight-year-old Emma, seven-year-old Allison, and five-year-old Katie. So, I mean, this really blew up in the media. These, you know, this car crash was publicized as a whole bunch of dead kids. No one really knew a lot, and we still don't know a lot of information so it was it was compelling, and that that's really what makes this case sort of special. Yeah, and, that, and that's what makes it so sad. There were five children under the age of nine, so eight and under, uh, in this car. And so it's, it's tremendously sad. And in the car, the Chevy Trailblazer that the minivan hit head-on, there were three men. Uh, it was 81-year-old Michael Bastardi, his 47-year-old son Guy Bastardi, and a family friend, uh, Daniel Longo. And there are also two occupants of the 2002 Chevy Tracker, uh, but they were basically just treated for minor injuries. Yeah, they actually survived the crash. So the crash occurred at 1.35 p.m., and at 1.33 p.m., two drivers noticed a minivan going onto the freeway, going up the exit ramp, basically in a wrong direction. Yeah, it was like they. it was like the minivan turned left, you know, from an exit ramp, went underneath the bridge, and where you would then go straight or turn left to get back on the highway, go in the right direction, they turned right and went right. up an exit ramp. 
So like you said, there were two drivers that sort of avoided her. Right. And then once she got on the highway, uh, you know, then a whole other slew of drivers had to avoid her as she was going the, in the wrong direction. And these these nine one one calls that were made um, during this because the the van was going down the freeway for almost two miles before the collision happened, so there was a you know a, a great number of calls that came into the police station describing the van who was driving it, and they're pretty chilling. These all of these people are pretty freaked out. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, it, it was basically in one minute four nine one one calls were made, and this, and then, and then other nine one one calls were made after the crash occurred. Right. So there were lots of nine one one calls being made. You know, you're going down the highway, minding your own business, going seventy, seventy five, or whatever you're doing, and you see a minivan plowing towards you, coming in from the opposite direction, going the same speed you are. It's absolutely terrifying, and. And that's why we picked this case today, you know. Uh, there's a lot of, there's some mystery to it. There's a lot of contra- controversy to it. And honestly, it's just very sad. And it's, there's a lot of, you know. Yeah, it's tragic. It, it really is. It's very it's, tragic. It's such a great loss of life for, uh, not, and there's not a lot of answers why really it happened. You and know? that's that's why we're doing this today. We want to go over what our theories are, what other people's theories have been. Sure. And, you know, I, I want to sort of make another disclaimer for this episode. We don't know everything that happened. Um, I've spent the last, you know, two weeks or so digging through, which I've known about this case for years, but I spent the last two weeks really going through all of the evidence and compiling a lot of notes on this. So we're going to try to get everything as perfect as we can. But there's a lot of people that believe that have different theories. They believe in different things. Even if there's one real, you know, one real thing that everyone knows happens, there's a lot of different theories as to why it happened. Exactly. And so that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to just prove, you know, give the facts to you and let you decide. And, and give our own theories as well. We'll save that for the end, though, I'm sure. Exactly. So, yeah, like I said earlier, we have Diane Schuler, and she was driving the minivan. And I'm just going to go over some, some basic people that are involved in this case. There's Diane Schuler. Uh, her, husband's, her husband's name is Daniel Schuler. And her sister-in-law, who is very um, uh, prevalent in this case, is Jay Schuler. That's Daniel's brother and, of course, Diane's sister-in-law. And then we have Jackie and Warren Hance. And Warren Hance is Diane's brother, and it was actually their minivan. And also the three nieces in the minivan that died, um, they are Jackie and Warren's Warren's, uh, children. So Jackie and Warren lost three kids in this. Exactly. And uh, Dominic Barbara, who is the Schuler lawyer... And and you'll hear Tom Ruskin's name come up, which is uh, who he was a private investigator that was hired by the family, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later. So our story starts actually the night before the crash. the uh, The family was all together at Hunter Lake Campground in Parksville, New York. Uh, they frequently went out there. They would, you know, spend their leisure time out at the campground, having fun, spending time with each other. Since, you know, both of the parents, Diane and Danny, worked different shifts. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that later. Um, but, you know, they didn't get to spend a lot of quality time with each other. So they would um, go to this campground and, and relax a little bit. And they would hike and swim and fish. And they do all the typical things you do while camping. And this particular weekend, they decided to take their three nieces with them. And again, just just to reiterate who the nieces were, we have Emma, who is eight years old, Allison, who's seven, and Kate, who is five. And this seems like a really nice sort of weekend getaway. And there are pictures of them at this campground. You know, there's pictures of all the children together, you know, her, you know having a good time, laughing, and it seems like everything went really well this week. And if you and if you hear Danny talk about this weekend uh, later on, he says that it was it was a fantastic weekend. So our story starts around 5 a.m. when Diane Schuler's husband Danny decides to get up early before the rest of the family, get a head start on his day. He goes and cleans the boat after a hard uh, weekend of having fun with the family. Uh, make sure he cleans everything up, 
probably attaches it to the truck and then heads back to camp. Yeah, and he and around seven a.m. and like like Stefan said, this is this happened around five or five thirty. This is when it started. Around seven, Diane wakes up and she gets the children up and ready and dressed, and they have a couple um, cups of coffee, and then they hit the road. And so they're leaving out of this campsite uh, pretty early, right around nine thirty, and they say bye to the camp owner. You know, she's real friendly with everyone that's there. Uh, she says bye. They say bye to the camp owner, and again, Daniel is in his truck. And he is pulling the boat, and Diane and all the children are in the minivan. And remember what I said earlier: uh, the minivan belongs to Warren Hans. Right. They had a, a a really big squad when they were going out, so they needed some extra room, and they were able to take the minivan out. Exactly. They borrowed it specifically for that reason. And so this is when everything begins. So now they have left the campsites. Uh, Daniel's supposed to go home with the boat, get the boat off. He also has the dog in the car, and he's going to go home and do laundry. And now from the campsite to the house is only about a 45-minute drive. Right. So it doesn't take very long for Danny to get home. However, uh, Diane stops at McDonald's, and this is normal. You know, she goes into McDonald's. They want to get food for all the children. Oh, yeah. And so they go in, and the kids go to the play area. She orders food. They all sit down and eat. And there is this, uh, there is sec- like a security video that shows the children eating and playing, and when they talk to the cashier at from McDonald's later, the cashier of course remembers Diane because you know well, it's not probably not hard to forget her and all of the children that came in. Sure. And the cashier says everything seemed fine, everything seemed normal. They just came in, they played, they ate, and then they left. Right, so around 10.30, uh, they actually leave McDonald's, which is impressive, feeding five kids and, and getting everyone to the bathroom and in the van in, in about 30 minutes is, is a, a feat in itself. But, yeah, I thought the same thing. However, they so they leave McDonald's at uh, 10.30, and by you know 10.45, uh, Schuler then gets gas at a gas station and she is seen on security footage talking to a clerk where she basically asks for gel caps or like some sort of Tylenol or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, When the cashier says, you know, we don't have, you know, whatever specifically she was looking for, I don't know, but um, they didn't have it at that particular gas station. So Diane then, you know, leaves but she's gassed up and the family decides to head south on route 17 yeah and it's it's pretty interesting because this was so they left mcdonald's at exactly 10 33 and they stopped to get uh gas and so she could find the um so she could basically find she could try to get the drugs the pain drugs at 10 46 this is only a 13 minute period between the time they leave mcdonald's and the time they get gas right so nothing really really interesting has happened in this time but like you said once she didn't actually purchase anything from inside the gas station because right. they don't have what they they don't have what she has and so she leaves and so like at 1058 they leave the gas station and they head south on route 17 hey i also think it's important to mention here we don't know who the pain medication was for either um it's not clear who needed the medicine if 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 it was Diane herself or if it was maybe one of the kids that had a headache or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an okay point. I, I really think that it was probably for her, though, because I don't know if the type of uh, painkiller she was looking for would be good for children. Right. Necessarily. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think probably the best thing just is to assume they're for her. Because I don't know if she she would give the kids some painkillers, especially when – it's kind of weird, too, especially when they're supposed to be home and – not very long. I mean, you know, this is a 40 or 45 minute drive. You know, they stop 13 minutes into a 45 minute drive to get painkillers. Right. You know? Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, could be, could have been children's Tylenol. Yeah. And it's weird. I wish we knew what. Yeah, we don't. You know, there was, asked for. they were on video on there. Yeah, it's true because there was video from the gas station, but. There's no audio for it. So we don't actually know what she asked for. Uh, but they did speak to the clerk. And the clerk, I don't think, remembers exactly what was said. Right. However, he remembers that she didn't seem out of it. She didn't seem – she seemed just completely normal. And then she's seen on camera at both McDonald's and the gas station walking very normally. Uh, she has a just a very normal stride, 
and she gets back in her in the minivan and she leaves. So at eleven thirty seven, with Schuler's phone, Emma, Diane's niece, calls her father Warren Hens who is at work in Floral Park and says in a 40-second conversation that they're running late, basically. And, um, you know, Diane gets on the phone as well with her brother and talks to him, and nothing really seems to be awry at all. No red flags are risen. Um, The family's just running a little bit late. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. It wasn't a very long conversation at all, and when... And when Warren is on the phone with Diane, yeah, he says nothing. She sounds completely normal. She's not slurring her words or anything like that. And this has now been two hours since they've left. Now, they stopped at McDonald's, but they were only at McDonald's for 30 30 minutes. minutes, yeah. They, you know, she was only at the gas station for a few minutes tops. So, you know, even now we have at least 45 minutes or so of unaccounted for time. Sure. And we we don't really know why. We don't really understand why. Um, but it's kind of weird that Emma, I guess, I guess it's not too weird to say that Emma would call her, her dad and say, we're going to be late. It's just by how late they already are is right. a bit concerning. And so after this, uh, really between 1130 and 12 or so, uh, the red minivan is seen being driven very aggressively on route 17. And this is said later by many witnesses on the road. Um, you know, one witness says she sees a woman who looks and is dressed like Schuler, uh, which was in a long sleeve, uh, black t-shirt and short pants, basically bent over on route 17 as if she was vomiting outside uh, Middletown. And so this is, this is the lady that actually sees someone that looks just like Diane, you know over a side rail, a guardrail, vomiting on the side of the road. This is at 11.45. And another witness uh, later sees the minivan pass their vehicle and zig and zag in and out of traffic very aggressively. It's important to mention here, not swerving all over the road. You know, the car is just zigzagging in and out. Not, um, I mean, it's aggressive, but it's not reckless per se. Exactly. It's not really... So yeah, it's not swerving, yeah. And so at around 12.08, like I said, that was at 11.45 when someone saw her uh, driving aggressively and someone else saw her a few minutes before uh, throwing up on the side of the road. But at 12.08, Jackie Hance, who is the mother of Emma, Allison, and Kate, calls Schuler's phone. They speak for less than two minutes, and nothing really seems out of the ordinary. Now, remember, this is now two and a half hours, over two and a half hours, really, since they've left the campground. And so this is starting to get pretty weird. And I'm sure that Jackie, you know, Jackie and Warren are getting concerned for their three daughters. I mean, I would be. I would definitely want to know what's happening. Yeah, exactly. And keep in mind, everyone, this is a Sunday. So, I mean, traffic isn't really something to be concerned about. It could certainly be a factor, but uh, it seems that on, you know, noon on a Sunday, it's probably not too congested. Yeah, definitely. So five minutes after the phone call with Jackie, uh, the van is seen going through uh, Harriman Toll Plaza. This is at 1213 at 12, between 12.15 and 12.45, um, many witnesses come forth later seeing as having seen a red minivan with children driven by a dark-haired woman weaving aggressively through traffic, going through lanes, blowing, their, blowing the horn of the vehicle. And they can also tell that none of the children in this van have seatbelts on because the children are going crazy back and forth, kind of going everywhere. Right. You can usually tell, especially in a minivan with all of the windows, you can usually tell if children don't have their seatbelts on if someone's driving very aggressively like that. Sure. Because you can see all the kids going all crazy in the back. I think they said there was one point during this uh, time period that she almost blew the horn for two miles. Yeah, so she was just on the horn. Uh, now, she- we should say... Uh, she, it was described by some people as she was driving like with a purpose, like she was really trying to get somewhere, mm-hmm. um, almost like she was in a in a trance, like she was, you know, yeah, like you said, wanting to get somewhere, like she had a purpose to what she was doing. It right. wasn't just, 
you know, chaotic necessarily, although it was chaotic, but it was, it was chaos with a purpose. That's how right. people described it. So again, between 1215 and 1245, one witness sees a red minivan pulled over um, just north of the throughway service area in Slotesburg. And this is another woman that says she sees someone who fits Schuller's description, and she's sitting on a guardrail, and she appears to be ill. And so I think what that means basically is she looks like she's bent over, and she might be, you know, throwing up. Right, and this is the second occurrence of that as well. Yeah. So something at this point is definitely gone awry exactly and another witness um basically said that this is a big one too another witness says the pulled over minivan enters the highway and begins tailgating them and like so close that the person in front of them couldn't see uh her headlights yeah i thought this was a pretty because i've so been there you know We've all sort of been been there, I'm yeah, sure, at one point. Yeah, so this guy just thinks that there's some nut behind behind him uh, using his own words uh, to, uh, you know, just going crazy behind him. She's also trying to pass from the shoulder, not even the other lane. She tries to pass from the shoulder of mm-hmm. the road. Yeah, and she's unsuccessful. So then she gets back behind him, and she's blowing. This is when it's said that she's blowing her horn for at least a mile. Right. She's just on the horn, just... I mean, I would say for the most part, nonstop for about a mile. Uh, And this witness, this particular witness, pulls into a service area and heads for the McDonald's. And the van actually follows uh, this car into the service area, but she heads into the truck parking area. And she supposedly drives over grass and everything to get to this truck area. And, you know, when they interview the people in this other car from this incident, Mm -hmm. it said that... The wife of the man who was driving said that she saw the person get Diane basically get out of the minivan and start becoming ill again. So right. bending over, looking as if she's throwing up. Now they're kind of far away, so it's kind of hard to tell if she's actually throwing up. Sure, but basically looking like she has gotten sick and that she's throwing up. But and this is the cons- third time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna. That's exactly what I was gonna say. It's consistent with what all the other stories we've heard. It's sort of she's not feeling so hot, mm-hmm, whatever yeah. that may be. And yeah. She keeps getting sick, and they don't go over and confront her. And the guy from that car says later that you know if he could do it all over again, then he would have. Right. You know, he would have went over there and confronted her, confronted her, and and would have seen the children in the car and would have seen that something was obviously wrong. Right, which is understandable. I I totally get that. So at 12.55 p.m. now, a 17-second phone call from Schuler's phone is dialed, but it's a wrong number, which is interesting. Um, We know earlier that Emma called her dad just fine, and it makes me wonder, like, why this wrong number was dialed. It makes me want to believe that it was actually Diane dialing the phone. Um, but it's really, it's hard to say for sure. Yeah, it's pretty hard to say because, you know, she gave the phone earlier to Emma, like you said. And who knows what children could have gotten. You can't find those numbers on public records, so you don't know what numbers were put in. Right. So we don't know if it was anything even remotely close to numbers that should have been put in. But not that long later, as we'll find out, more wrong numbers were dialed uh, from the phone. Right. So three minutes after this 17-second phone call, um, Schuler then calls Jackie Hance, which is the mother mother of the, you know, the, her, Diane's three nieces, essentially. And Jackie is instantly worried. Diane sounds out of it, and she, they can tell that, that something is going wrong. So this phone call lasts two and a half minutes, roughly, and then the signal is lost, and the call is dropped. Mm-hmm. And so Jackie Hans is obviously, at this moment, very concerned about everything. Right. And, uh... You know, she can. I'm pretty sure in this phone call, she can hear the children in the background crying, and she can te- she can definitely tell that there is some panic in the children's voices in the background of this phone call. Sure, definitely. So three minutes after that phone call was made, Warren Hance arrives home um, from the 
from his office. Mm-hmm. And so he, arri- he arrives home right after this call ended. And he calls Schuler back, and they speak for about eight minutes. And as Schuler goes through uh, the tollway at 1.02 p.m., Schuler sounds disoriented, and em- Emma gets on the phone, and Diane pulls over. And Emma sounds upset, but she says that she's all right. And they see a sign for Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. Mm-hmm. And basically, Diane gets back on the phone, and Warren tells her to wait where she is. Uh, also, during this call, this is sort of weird, too, and it sort of um, gives some credibility to her, uh, how discombobulated she was. But when she talks to her brother, Warren, she calls him Danny, which is her husband's name. So you can tell she's really sort of out of it at this point. She doesn't even know who she's talking to. Yeah, and she's very confused about everything, it seems like. Right. And after this, you know, that call was around 101 or so. And around 110, someone in the minivan dials three wrong numbers in one minute. So, again, they're dialing wrong numbers. We don't know who it is. Honestly, my vote is... F- it was Diane. Yeah, me it too. It was, you know, she like you like you just said she uh, called her brother by the by the wrong name, by her husband's name. Yep. She's definitely disoriented. I feel like she probably dialed the wrong numbers not understanding what was happening. And what's so crazy about this next part is she actually leaves her phone neatly on a concrete barrier. It was basically, you know, like the concrete barriers barriers that are on the side of the highway. She yeah. just leaves her phone sitting there. It's actually picked up, yeah, by someone who who finds it, and they say, you know, that, and it was off when they found it. By the way, she turns her phone off, or the battery had died. We don't know mm. for sure, but it's picked up, yeah, and it's left neatly right on the side of the road. Why this would happen again is up to, you know, it's up for debate. We don't know exactly, and and now we know that Warren Hans is on his way. He's on the way to where. Uh, The phone is, really, he's on the way to where they they were last known to be. And he tries, so he tries to call the phone multiple times, and about a dozen other calls go straight to her voicemail over the next 20 minutes. So from 1.10 or so, or 1.15, to 1.30, to 1.35, 12 calls were made to the phone. They all went to voicemail. So obviously Warren Hens is pretty freaked out at this point and he makes a decision to go ahead and call the police and while I mean on this 911 call he basically says that he's worried and they believe Diane is having some sort of medical emergency whatever that may mean. Yeah because Emma told her dad and correct me if I'm wrong but didn't Emma tell her dad that uh, she was having that Diane was having a hard time seeing. Yeah, she couldn't see. S- something is wrong with Aunt Diane. Yeah, she and her can't head, see. Her head hurt. And so right. this, you know, these things lead to an obvious conclusion that something is wrong with Diane, and she's having some type of medical. I mean, even maybe she's having a stroke. Maybe she's having something. Um, so they believe this is happening. And so now the police are out there. This happened in 2009, so they're. I think they're trying to track the cell phone, but they're having a hard time, obviously, doing that. Right. And so now, and this is this is a long stretch of highway, so they're just looking for this red minivan. Sure. It takes time for this to happen. It's just not magical. Right. You know, which if is unfortunate. If the cell phone is off, it can't ping towers and give and Even if it location. is, even if it is on, it's not, I don't think it's that easy to do that. I think it takes time. You sure. Know? It's not like they can just... It's not like CIA, I don't think. Right. I think it's harder than that. <laughs> triangulate where you're at. So sometime after 1.30 p.m., now, mind you, they left the campsite at 9.30. We're now at 1.30. So we're uh, at four hours. Right. I mean, what should have been a 40 to 45-minute drive has turned into a four-hour drive, and there seems to be a lot of missing time here. Well, it seems like they, they got off the highway, they went driving at other places, they got back on the highway. It seems like she is wasting time for some reason. Definitely. So, uh, like you just said, right around 1.30, Schuler turns right from Pleasantville Road onto an exit ramp uh, for the Teutonic State Parkway, heading the wrong way, mind you. So she drives south and into northbound traffic for about 1.7 miles. Um, so while she does this, it sends all of the motorists 
coming down the parkway into a panic and they're forced to swerve and try and get out of the road. Um, Diane is reported to just be looking straight ahead with her hands on the wheel and, you know, go in, you know, 75, 80 miles per hour. Yeah, it's it's not like she's swerving everywhere. It's not like she's intentionally trying to hit people. Right. Because there was a dozen people, there were a dozen dozen other cars that actively swerved to get out of the way of this minivan. And so, like you said, she's just going in a straight line and she's just going as fast as she can. She looks very determined. Um, you see you see the interviews with people that were in the cars avoiding her and they say that she, you know, she was almost in a trance. That that she was in some type of trance-like state. And at a 135, the minivan smashes head on into the vehicle carrying the three men. So after the collision actually happens, the minivan sort of rolls down off of the road and it's it caught on fire essentially. Um and then the the truck that was carrying the three men um, then struck another truck with two passengers in it that we mentioned earlier. But by 137, state police are called to the scene and they arrive. Yeah, and so this is, you know, this causes heavy traffic. There are a bunch of people getting out of their cars to do whatever they can. Some people are helping. And two men uh, get out of their car and go straight to the minivan which is now probably starting to starting to catch fire right i imagine the engine probably caught fire first or something and it it took time for it to spread it didn't just catch a blaze and so two men got out of their car uh went down to to help and they they noticed that diane was dead immediately and they opened up. They either opened up the door, or they just tried to pull her out, or whatever happened. I and, think they pulled her out mm-hmm. of the window, or something like that. Something like that. And and she falls on top of them, and and she's dead. And they're pulling out uh, the four young girls, the three nieces, and their daughter, and none of them have have a pulse. And they don't even see Brian, uh, the five year old Brian, underneath the seat curled up they don't they don't see brian at all they just they get all the girls out this is a very traumatic experience for them obviously because right. they're pulling dead children out of a minivan they're checking their and it's pulse. a pile of dead children at that exactly you know? and 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 they also noticed that none of the girls were or none no one was wearing seat belts and this is known because this crash was so bad that the car was so pulverized that if you look at pictures of it it's not like it's a car anymore. It's a, a frame almost. It looks like yeah, and a lot of the it's a, now it's just an open it's an open metal frame. It's like a shell. So these children have some of them have flown out of the car because they weren't wearing seat belts, and now there's a gigantic hole in the side of the of, of the minivan. And you know, during this time, obviously, a whole bunch of motorists have pulled off of the side of the road as well. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time the cops show up, people are trying to take pictures. I mean, obviously, to try and document what's happening. But it's still terrible. Like, they're getting pictures of these dead kids and, mm-hmm. and bodies slung all so, over the road. Yeah, so a lot of people hold up big white sheets uh, to block off the site from everyone else. Right. Because yeah, people have cell phones at this this is 2009, people have cell phones. Sure. So they're you know, they're bringing out their cell phones and they're taking pictures. And so all three of the men in the Trailblazer are dead. And all three of Warren and Jackie's children are dead. The 2-year-old girl is dead and Diane is dead. The only survivor out of these two cars is five-year-old Brian. Right. That's eight people and four children dead and just just these two cars. And again, the two people in the other, the third vehicle were treated uh, in a nearby hospital just for minor injuries. And Brian sustained pretty ver- uh, pretty serious 
injuries. I mean, he had a very serious head injury. He ended up having he su- he's suffering from ocular motor nerve palsy, uh, which basically affects movement in his right eye. And he actually had to undergo surgery later uh, for this. And he does daily exercises with his father and his aunt um, to basically try to correct everything that's happening so miraculous that he was even able to survive in the first place you know when they take him out of the car they notice that brian is alive and his eyes are shut and he's crying and that's how they find this little boy yeah and the the person that the i think it was the fire the fire um the head chief of the fire department you Mm -hmm. know um said that this is a good sign that when they bring out the child if he's crying, he's combative, it's a good sign uh, right. that he's not, you know, maybe not in shock or doing something else. So they take him to the hospital, and he is he does recover and he does survive. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, when, they, when they do pull Diane Schuler out, um, they do notice a broken uh, bottle of absolute vodka near the front of the car where Diane was located. Mm-hmm. And it's said to be about... A liter, but really it's broken. So right away, it's kind of hard to tell how big it is. But you know, it's probably a one liter to one point seven five liter uh, bottle of vodka. And yeah, like you said, it is broken in the in the front driver's seat. So I just want to talk about this. You know, the Jackie and Warren Hans, Diane's. Um, you know, Diane's brother and his wife, they lose three of their kids on one day. And also the three men in the truck, um, Michael Bastardi, who was 81 years old, his son, Guy Bastardi, who was 47, and their family friend, Dan Longo, who was 74. And these guys were just going to a family dinner to enjoy the rest of their day. And their lives were tragically taken from them. Yeah, and if you listen to family members of these men talk, you know, two of them were elderly for the most part in their 70s and early 80s. And, you know, but they say that they were retired and that they were still very active in their community and with their families. And they even even at their age, they feel their lives were cut short. And I can't imagine how hard it would be to lose all three children in one day. Yeah. You know, I think that's the part that got me the most when I was trying to research this is when they talk, when Jackie and Warren talk about it, they lost all three of their all three of their children in one afternoon. And you can't just live life normally after that, man. It's like nothing is ever the same again, you know. And I I think as we go on to these these next parts, uh, we're going to kind of go into the more controversial issues with this case. Uh, keep that in mind that Jackie and Warren lost all three of their children in just a, five seconds. Right. I mean. So five days after the tragedy, an autopsy was performed on Diane, and it's found that her blood alcohol content came back as point one nine, which is a lot for anyone wondering. <laughs> well, the legal limit uh, for New York is 0.08. Uh, so this is, o- this is over double. Right, right. Double. And they say if you get around uh 0.3, that's the blackout range typically for a, a normal human being. So Diane is almost there. Well, and it really depends too. It's not, that's not really set in stone, obviously. Sure, it's like, sure. it depends on the weight of the person. It depends on their tolerance and also depends on, um, how fast the alcohol is consumed. Right. Uh, Also to mention here, when they do the autopsy, they actually find a high level of THC in her system as well, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. So we know that that is somehow involved in this too. Yeah, and when we talk about, or when anyone talks about THC in someone's system, you know, you can smoke weed and the THC is still in your system 15 days later. But there are ways of checking to see how much of something is in your system. And when the medical examiners went over all this, they say that she smoked anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour before the crash. Before the crash, which puts Diane in the car with the children smoking. Mm -hmm. 
and and obviously drinking as well. So and so th- and these are you know these are facts from the autopsy. You know these aren't speculations. This, this is what the autopsy shows. Right now, in that first initial autopsy as well, they also find that there was no evidence of a medical event or any signs of stroke or anything like that. Yeah, and and the reason that we bring this up is, you know, the Schuler family, which is really um, Daniel and Jay Schuler, who is Daniel's brother and was Diane's uh, sister-in-law. Right. They don't buy any of this. They don't believe that Diane was an alcoholic. They don't believe that she ever really drank that much. Right. They don't believe any of it. They think it's all complete bullshit. Yeah, they don't even they don't believe the autopsy. They, they don't they don't believe the autopsy at all. They will just straight up come out and say um, this is incorrect and the the experts that performed the autopsy were mm-hmm. incorrect. Well, and I think, you know, it's a fair point in some sense. It wouldn't be the first time an autopsy got botched and paperwork got mixed up. Who knows? Anything's sort of possible. Um, so I get them being skeptical of it at first. I mean, however, they do record that Diane uh, had at least a shot's worth of uh, vodka in her stomach as well. Yeah, that had yet to be metabolized. Right. Right. So Dominic Barbara, who was the attorney, uh, the attorney for the Schuler family, they held a press conference uh, where media was allowed in. They were all on microphones and they were all videotaped. And this press conference was really weird uh, because the family was very combative to everything, to every question. The attorney uh, Dominic, he was very combative to anything they had to say, and they basically went on there uh, just to announce that Diane was not an alcoholic, that she did not drink very often, and how Daniel knows in his heart that she did not drink that day. Again, Jay Schuler, again, who is Daniel's brother and was Diane's sister-in-law, uh, she also speaks, she says very similar things. She says how Diane was a, such a, was a very, very good mother, how there was no way any of this could be correct, how the autopsy was 100% um, false, and, you know, Jay says that she just wants Brian to remember her mom as a great mother because Brian's the only survivor and that she would never do anything like this. Right. And then Jay goes on to actually say that she can't even think about what would happen if a second autopsy was performed in it and it actually would have come back with the same results um, to show that, in fact, she was drunk and, you know, was high at that point. And, and not even, you know, a second autopsy, sure, but she she goes as far to say that she believes that once they get the test results back, they want they want to get the test results from the autopsy performed sure. again. They want all the samples to be performed again, and they want to make the, they want to make sure that Diane's DNA, the DNA that they have, the DNA that they're testing, is actually Diane's. But yeah, she says that even if that second wave of tests come back uh, exactly the same, uh, she doesn't even pro- she won't even process that because she knows that Diane would never allow them to go through all this just to be proved wrong. That's very close to what she actually said. Right, and the the family's lawyer also makes the same noises as well. This, to me, is, is just... It doesn't seem right. It seems like they're so convinced before... You know, it, even in the face of evidence, they're, con- they're convinced of the opposite. Well, here's the thing, too. Okay, so they go... They want to show Diane as a saint... They don't just want to say that Diane is not an alcoholic and that she would never have drank that that much. Right. They they try to make her come off as a saint, as the best mother in the world, as someone who everyone looked up to, everyone went to when they needed help. And this is something uh, this is a very psychological thing. Okay, so for one, so we can, you know, say whatever we want about Daniel, which we will, and sure. Jay. The thing is, they only know her, uh, how they know her. They only know her as a, as a very good mother, as a hardworking person, as, sure. as someone that maybe they didn't see her drink very often. Mm-hmm. And so that's what they know. And so at a certain point, you have to stop living in denial. 
But in the beginning, I could see how it might be hard to imagine this loving family member of yours doing this. Right, especially if someone just tells you. Now, seeing the paperwork is is something different uh, completely, but... They don't want to believe this. They not only do they try and tell Brian, her son, that, you know, his mom was a great mother. They try and, you know, change the public's opinion about this case as well by making several appearances and doing interviews like on Larry King and stuff like that. I, we'll talk more about exactly. that later. I mean, the original press conference that the lawyer and the family held is to do just that. You know, they say that they one thing they change their story many times, but they say that they want to. They're just doing this so Brian can live, um, knowing that his mother didn't wasn't a bad mother and wouldn't do this. Right. And they also, but they also say that they're doing this because they want, because they don't want the victims, the families of the victims, the three men, to believe that a drunk driver. This just killed them, me. which is to me is absolutely insane that anyone could ever do. It would be much better to to accept the fact that Diane was an alcoholic and try to help other people who are alcoholics, other people who might be closet alcoholics. Right. That would be better. That would be much much better than just saying than trying to prove everyone wrong. It's it's just making it worse for the victims' families. Yeah, and it makes it worse for their case too as well. I mean, it just instead of, you know, rolling with the punches and sort of taking the evidence as it comes in, they're willing to deny everything. And once you get on that road, it's like, where do you stop? Exactly, because, yeah, you're right. It's like once that is taken over and you're – you know, you are neck deep in, in in denial and doing all these things. It's very hard to turn back. Right, it's now makes a conspiracy it even conspiracy at this point. Exactly, you know? and you know, Daniel is on camera saying that he wants to know the truth, that he wants to know if Diane had a stroke or not, because that's really what the family believes. The family believes that something medical must have happened. Uh, they, to my knowledge, have never, to this day, admitted that she was drunk. I don't believe that they have. However, I do believe that they, that they, they, that they, in their heart, I believe that they actually think that. But again, Daniel says he just wants to know the truth. He claims that he wants to know the truth that day. Um, you know, no matter what it is, no matter if it's bad or good. But the, then he also claims, ten seconds after saying this, that he knows one hundred percent that the experts are lying. And that the experts don't know the truth. For some unknown reason, they're lying. Yeah, he doesn't want to know the truth. He just wants to hear what he b- believes. Right. He he has no intention of actually figuring out the truth. He just wants to know that he that they are right and that she was not an alcoholic and all this all this all this right. stuff. Right. And they they go back to the McDonald's and they go back to the gas station and uh, like we mentioned earlier, you know. Authorities speak to these people and ask them if anything was strange about Diane, if she was acting, you know, irregularly. And they say that they didn't smell alcohol, that she was acting completely normal, um, which makes sense because, honestly, that was earlier on in the day as well. I mean, a lot happened after she left that gas station and McDonald's as well. Yeah, that was in, you know, the first... What I mean, so they left McDonald's at what ten thirty? They got there at nine fifty six. They left at ten thirty three. Exactly, and then thirteen minutes later, they went to the gas station. They left very quickly after that. So, the two instances where people were up close and personal with Diane are are so yeah, like you said, they're so early on that no one could take that. You know, obviously, yeah, she probably didn't drink at that point. She probably sure. didn't do anything at that point. Anything could have happened in the next three hours. Exactly. So however. And we know that she was going into the gas station to try to get pain medication for whatever reason, which we'll go over that. But it's, right. you know, at this point, I would say, yeah, there, I would agree there was no drinking done uh, before the gas station or McDonald's. Totally. Yeah. And so, real quick, not real quick, really, we're going to go over Diane's background. And because I think this has a lot to do, 
uh, in this case, it's very important. Uh, Diane was born and raised in Floral Park, New York, uh, which is just a town over from the you know, the home that the family shared. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was born in 1973, and she was the fourth child and only girl uh, to Warren Hans Sr. and Eileen um, McCow. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But at the age of nine years old, Diane's mother, Eileen, she left the family. And to, to our knowledge, to anything that I could find, Diane never actually saw her mother again. Yeah, she wanted nothing to do with her. I think it's said that her mom actually uh, left the family, had met another man, and estranged from the family, essentially. Exactly. And later on, we know that the that her brothers, all three of her brothers, did have contact and did form at least a very minimal relationship with Diane's mother. Right. But Diane never did. And she always held this grudge against uh, her mother. Yeah, I can't blame her, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it wouldn't be... And it's not uncommon for people to do that at all. I mean, that makes sense to me, at least. Yeah, and, you know, why this is important, you know, this happens a lot. Parents leave a lot. And this is not the outcome to even 99% of those cases. It happens a lot. But why I think this is important is, you know, well, first we should talk about Diane's personality a little bit. Sure. Um, She was a very uh, controlling person. Yeah, she she was an executive as well. She had drive. She had focus. She, She was the main breadwinner of the family, man. She made all the money. Yeah, I mean, she had to be in control of everything um, that she was in part of, right? I mean, she and she was a very hardworking person, and this is something that is said about people that whose whose mother in particular leave at a very early age. It's very common for those people to develop that type of personality where they have to be in control. The reason for that, of course, is because. Um, you know, your mother leaves. Now you are you feel out of control right. at a at a time in your life where you very much need uh, you very much need someone to be there for you. And she had three brothers, so there were four children. And now all four children stayed with the with the the father. So sure. he's working a job, I'm sure, to provide for all of them. And and all four of these kids are alone, so they don't have probably they don't have much of a structural support system in their household. And so I think this is a good reason as to why her personality developed into such a controlling one. Yeah, I'm assuming things here, but I also think that she probably had to take on some of the duties her mother had performed before as well. And that's for sure. That's a lot for a nine year old, you know? Exactly. And, you know, the reason why all this is important is, you know, she she only dated Daniel. She had never had a boyfriend before uh, her and Daniel met. They met at one of her friend's weddings. And they met there, and, and, and he was her first true love. And the reason why this is so interesting is because he is the opposite of her. Sure. You know, whenever his parents were spoken to in an interview Mm -hmm. they said that he was like her fourth child right and she was the boss she definitely wore the pants in the relationship yeah our third child third child i guess right right and that's the thing is like when you when you have that you know now she's she's become this super mom this super uh employee at her job really a boss at her job she's mm-hmm. doing all of these things she has control of everything and she has this husband who quite frankly is kind of lazy right you know he works uh, a nighttime part-time job he doesn't make very much money and he is basically in control or is out of control you know she's in control of everything that they do right and she yeah she basically has him you know well, I don't blame her, honestly. She's basically doing all the work with the kids. She's making most of the money for the house. So I could see how um, one could find that conclusion, you know? Yeah, and and they worked opposite shifts as well. And so they didn't really get to see each other that often. Like I said, uh, he Daniel worked a nighttime position. And so she would get home at around 7 or so and 6.37 and take care of the kids 
and do everything for the kids while he, you know, take a nap, go to sleep or whatever, and then go off to work at night. And so they didn't get to see each other very often, which is why they would always go on these weekend trips, these weekend camping trips. Yeah, and so she's looked at as being this, again, this super mom. And so she has a lot of stress. And so so what do the family what does the family think about her when everyone is saying that she's an alcoholic and that she was drinking during that day what exactly do they come out and say so the family says that she would drink her her husband more specifically comes out and says that she would drink occasionally you know after the kids were put in bed and the laundry was done uh you know she would enjoy an occasional drink and actually at at first he won't actually own up to this it actually later he'll change his mind and story but he he does admit eventually that you know she did enjoy her occasional drink and when they bring up the pot smoking she or he says that you know she would occasionally but she wasn't some some pothead i thought it was funny too in in one of the interviews her sister or uh, her sister-in-law says you know you would never know she smoked she smoked pot. I'm like, okay, well, you would never know she was drinking either, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, boy, you can't smell either one of those things. Yeah, exactly. You know? The during the original press conference that they held, they were asked about uh, the bottle of vodka because the bottle of vodka is, is now known that there was one there. Everyone saw it. Mm-hmm. And here's where the story changes a little bit. Daniel originally said in that conference that he did not have any idea where the bottle came from he denies knowing that the bottle exists right Mm -hmm. well didn't he say that he packed it in they they had a bottle but it was in the camper no at at first he denies it it, it exists so when so during that conference they ask him he says i have no idea i have no idea where that bottle came from i've never known it i don't know what it is that's what he said in the conference however later uh on the larry king interview he, Larry brought up the bottle of vodka, and this time, uh, Daniel said, like you just said, they usually keep a bottle of vodka in the camper for the camping trips. Right, and I, I love Larry during this interview. He straight up asks him, he's like, so, you know, is it possible, is there a possibility your wife could be an alcoholic and you not know it? And and again, he just denies it. He's like, no way, I've known her for 13 years. Uh, no way, no. Yeah. And when, and when he presses further uh, about the bottle of vodka, you know, Daniel claims that Diane packed all of the bags when they were getting ready to leave that day and that she already – that she packed the bottle of vodka in a bag for the, mini, van, the minivan for unknown reasons. And here's the thing. Larry King asks why did she pack the bottle into the minivan right. because it's in the camper. And if it's in the camper – and it's and and Daniel also says that he would drink, that you know it was really him that would drink, and mm-hmm. they would take it back and forth from the camper to the house because he during the week would have a couple drinks. Again, trying to shift the blame off of Diane, maybe onto himself. Exactly, but he cannot answer the question as to why Diane took the bottle of vodka and put it in a bag for the minivan. And this is something, yeah, he just cannot answer this question. And he doesn't know why she would do this. And this is when he, this is when Larry brings up, don't you think it's possible? Right. All things considered. And he just cannot admit to anything. He just doesn't believe it. And so, and th- so this is the first instance in this story where, where we really see uh, Daniel changing out his story. You know, like you, I think you said earlier, actually, that he says that she doesn't ever drink, really. And and now she he changed that and said that okay well now she has the occasional drink right you know at first right after uh, right after everything happened and the autopsy results came back he was just in denial mode in lying mode honestly from the very get go and just came straight out of the gates just no she never drank I've never seen her drunk which he still claims to this day that he's never seen his wife drunk ever yet they keep a handle of vodka in a camper okay yeah mm-hmm. I buy it yeah 
So as we mentioned earlier, Diane was painted to be this responsible figure. You know, she was a director of credit and billing uh, collections with a salary around $100,000. So she's doing very well for herself. Um, and slowly but surely, Diane's co-workers come out and they say that, you know, Diane would go out to bars and have a good time and they saw her drink they saw her get drunk and you know during these conversations she would talk about how unhappy she was with her relationship and make comments about her husband being lazy mm -hmm. and and she would also complain about her job and how stressful that is I mean if you're making a hundred thousand dollars and you're doing sure she's a director of, of stuff She's a director, like you just said. Right. So she has a very stressful job. And yeah, and you know, it makes sense. That's what people do at bars. You, you know, you get a couple of drinks in you, and then that honesty starts to pour out of you. Exactly. And here's the thing: I said earlier that they that Daniel and Diane worked separate hours. He didn't. It's it, it's honestly kind of astonishing how little Daniel knew about Diane. Yeah, you know, he, it, he he never prodded for any information about anything. Not even her mother, you know. He never. If it was me, and I could see, you know, obviously this affected my wife in a certain way. I I mean, I wouldn't say I would pry, but I would at least want to know and expect to get some reasonable answers out of that. And if I didn't, I would keep digging. Exactly, exactly. And so that's a good example of how. Yeah, he didn't really know her that well. And so, you know, the family says that they never saw her get drunk. They barely saw her drink. For one thing, I think that's just a lie in general. Right. But at the same time, it makes sense because they didn't work the same hours. I don't think that they did stuff that often together. Meanwhile, her friends and her work family, really, the people that she works with, and it was really a work family because sure. they were all very close, they would go out to bars and they would drink and she would get drunk. Sure. So it's interesting to think that her husband knew so little about Diane that, you know, the fa her coworkers knew more about her. Something tells me that he knew his wife just fine and that he was trying to paint a picture of of Maybe. something that was not accurate to reality. Maybe. Honestly, during this entire case, I just do not trust Daniel at all. Yeah. I think he has lied from the very beginning. I think he has lied for, I mean, you know, for certain reasons, maybe for, for some other unknown reasons, uh, he is just lying through his teeth about a lot of things. It's sure. just the way, it's the way I, it's the, it's the way He's I think. He's in denial, you hey, know. I mean, they're definitely all in denial, but, you know, I think in the end he, he knows and he believes that she did drink that day and he just can't admit it now. So the family of Diane and with the family's lawyer, uh, Dominic Barbara, they hire a PI by the name of Tom Ruskin, and they actually retest all the samples that were taken from Diane to confirm that it was actually her DNA, and they they basically want to corroborate just to make sure there wasn't any mix-ups in the test. Exactly, and and there was a lot of there was a lot of mix-ups. Uh, with the Tom with Tom Ruskin in the first place, you know, if you listen to the family talk about it, at first he wanted ten thousand dollars, and then he wanted twenty thousand sure. dollars, and then he wanted thirty thousand dollars, and the the prices just kept going up. And it said that Tom Ruskin just kind of dipped out of the picture after he was paid, and that's what they say. Right. I don't know if I believe this or not because, as we find out, Tom Ruskin did in fact do everything that he was supposed to do. Right, yeah, the family never claim the family basically claims that he just didn't say anything after that. He essentially just took their money. Exactly. He just took their money and didn't really do anything. However, we find this to be somewhat untrue. Right. Um because he did in fact uh make sure that the DNA was Diane's and he did uh retest all of the samples that they that they that they picked out. Right. Now, the family well, and honestly, more importantly, Dominic Barbara claims that he never received the tests, which end up getting 
it, it just hangs everything up and makes everything even more convoluted and exactly. shadowed. And then, and then when they talk to Tom Ruskin, Tom Ruskin says that he did in fact send the test over to the lawyer Dominic. And so it's it's kind of like they don't know who to believe, and this this only takes their skeptical, you know, my, you know, their skeptical brains, what they're thinking about this, to a right. whole another level. It they just only amplifies it exactly. They just become even more skeptical because they don't know who to believe. Right, and there may be some sort of persecution complex going on here too, as well, where they think you know everyone's sort of out to get them, and they're trying to paint Diane as some alcoholic that you know lost control of her family and life. Exactly. And so Tom Ruskin gives gives them a call after they try to get a hold of him. And he says the tests have been sent over to Dominic, the lawyer, and he says the tests all came back exactly the same. So all of the tests come back the same. He is 100% convinced that the DNA was Diane's. And, and that's it. Everything came back exactly the same. Right. Now, we should also mention a theory that's sort of tossed around is that Diane had some sort of abscess tooth, and that may have been a reason why she was drinking. And the family actually points this out, too. They talk about how she would always sort of rub her cheek, um, alluding to, you know, she was having some sort of dental pain going on. Yeah, I mean, so... Before they find out the second test results, they go and they they meet up with Dr. Werner Spitz. Now, do you remember who this doctor was? I didn't. Oh, you didn't? Do you do you know who he is now? I do. Okay, so Dr. Werner Spitz, for one thing, he's a very well-known uh, forensic pathologist. He's worked on the cases of uh, JFK, of Martin Luther King Jr. He's worked uh, for many different cases, but he also worked on a, on a case that we covered— our second ever right. episode. Episode two, check it out. Yeah, uh, which was the Casey Anthony, the death of Kaylee Anthony. And honestly, in that trial, I thought uh, he, I, I honestly think that in, in the Kaylee Anth- the Casey Anthony trial, that he was paid to say some really stupid things, I think, because he really did not make any sense in that trial. But anyways, back to this case. So Jay and Daniel meet up with Dr. Werner Spitz, and Spitz basically goes over um, he goes over all of the tests that were done. He goes over the original autopsy paperwork. He goes over all the lab results, all the DNA results. And he comes to the conclusion that everything was done perfectly. Right. And it is on video in the documentary uh, that it's, it's on video showing Jay and Daniel actually basically arguing with Dr. Werner Spitz about this. I mean, they're saying, you know, Dr. Warner Spitz asks Jay, what do you think happened? And Jay goes, well, I'm not an expert, but I think that something in the autopsy, they just didn't, they just didn't perform it correctly. Maybe they were going too fast. Maybe they messed up. She says something to that, to that degree. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you just see, you just see Dr. Spitz just baffled that these two people are sitting here arguing with him. This, this guy is old. He's been doing it for decades. Right. He doesn't have time for this. Exactly. And, you know, he's very nice to them, but you can tell that he's he just doesn't doesn't really want to hear their, their emotional arguments that they've been making uh, during this entire case. Right. And, you know, basically they think, they ask him, you know, could an abscess tooth, could it have caused her to have some type of stroke and to maybe grab the the bottle of vodka instead of her water. Sure. And so that's their theory, and they ask him, and he says, he says, in theory, that could be the case. An abscess tooth might cause a stroke or something. Right. But he also says, like we've already said, he also says that there is no evidence of any type of stroke or TIA or anything like that. And so... You know, he just answers it. He answers it like that. And he answers it correctly. He says that, you know, there really isn't, there's no proof that that happened. Yeah. And 
even more to that point, if that were the case, I'm fine with accepting the fact that maybe she she did have a medical emergency and had a stroke. But usually people that are driving and having strokes tend to at least pull over, especially when there's, you know, five kids in the car as well. It's you don't drive fast down the highway the wrong way. It just doesn't doesn't add up. Yeah, I mean, unless she was just so delusional, unless she was just so she was in some she was in she was in delirium, uh, unless she was just so confused, she had no idea what was happening. But I just don't see that being the case. You know, that's what the family is trying to prove this entire time, right? And they won't admit that that she drank at all. I mean, the only time they've even re- remotely said maybe she drank by accident was to, to my knowledge, was to Dr. Werner Spitz. And, you know, even he says that the, the idea of that is just very unlikely. You know, after all of this went down, there were a, a numerous amount of lawsuits that basically were filed between all parties of this incident. And I really do feel bad for Warren Hentz in all of this. He he caught a lot of um, unnecessary nonsense, if you ask me. I mean, because it was his van that was used, um, he basically was sued by almost everyone, including his his um uh, his brother in law. Yeah, his brother in law. Well, Daniel, it was really just Daniel suing people. I mean, sure. so Daniel sued Warren Hans just for the fact that it was his minivan. It doesn't make any sense. He's just grasping for anything he he can he can grasp for. And and Daniel also also sued the state of New York, right? For the basically he in his suit it said that there were inadequate signs on the exit ramp that diane got on right so it's like and by the way this like this never happens no i mean this never happens i don't think i don't know if it's ever happened in the history of uh, of new york automobile accidents right but he's saying that there were there were not adequate signs on the exit ramp to let people know uh, that you're going in the wrong direction which by the way there are numerous signs saying do not enter a yeah. one way do not it's just a lie exit it's a only complete lie exactly it's just a lie and it's it's pretty interesting to to think about why daniel is doing this why is he doing this you know right he wants to get some vindication for his wife but at the expense of of what his, the rest of his family i mean warren just had to warren and jackie both had to deal with the death of their three children and now on top of it you know let's add in some lawsuits it just doesn't seem doesn't seem right to me at all yeah and and Daniel, or not Daniel, but Warren and Jackie, after the accident, after losing all three of their children, they really just, they didn't talk about it that much. They didn't go off and say that they thought Diane was a great mother and not an alcoholic. Sure. They didn't really do any of that. And so they, they were really just wanting to move on with their lives. And then Daniel comes in and sues them for literally no reason. I mean, they there was no reason to be sued. It was right. his minivan. There's there's no evidence to show that the minivan had anything to do with this crash sure. whatsoever. Yeah, I, I really feel bad. I mean, the one glimmering uh, light in this story is really that, you know, later on they would go and, and have another kid. And um, it seems that the family was able to deal with their or at least cope with their grief in a productive manner and still be able to live, you know, sort of productive lives after this. So um, that's at least the the best thing to come out of this, really. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and in the documentary, they Jay is on camera, and she's talking about Daniel. And it doesn't... I don't really know if she knows she's on camera because this is not... A, this doesn't look like a formal a formal interview mm-hmm. that you would usually see in a documentary. This sort of looks like she doesn't know that she's on camera, that the camera's a little lower than she is, and she's just talking candidly about everything. But she's talking about Daniel, and she's talking about the conversation that her and Daniel um, had privately. 
and how Daniel has said that he doesn't forgive Diane for all of this, and he's really stubborn about everything, and he's really angry, and which you know what, it it might be hard to forgive her for this for this, you know that kind of comes down to a personal thing that you have to overcome, right? But the reason she gives for Daniel not being able to forgive Diane is not because his three nieces are dead, not because one of his children has died and that his wife is dead, or for the three sta- three strangers to him are dead, but that because he is now left uh, to be a single dad and that he didn't even want to have kids in the first place. Right, so he's left to basically pick up the pieces that Diane left because she, you know, did what she did. Yeah, and 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 he also says that you know she's supposed to be here to do all this. Those are those are basically his his words that he uses. That she's supposed to be here, and I'm not supposed to do this. It's just crazy. And that's the reason why he can't forgive Diane for doing any of this. And I think that's. Uh, very insane. Yeah, definitely. And so there's one other thing that I want to mention real quick that no one else has really mentioned. And honestly, take this with a grain of salt um, because I do believe it to be true. However, I don't really know if it had anything to do with the crash. Uh, Diane had been prescribed Ambien by her doctor. And, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people on Reddit about this and I read a lot of conversations about it. And, you know... Ambien is is something that if you take and then you don't go to sleep and you and you stay up through it, you can do things and not remember them. You can completely black out. It can make you confused. It can make you. Uh, it, it will put you in a trance like state where you won't respond to people very well. You won't know exactly where you're at. And then then if you drink knowingly or unknowingly right. and smoke weed or do anything like that, it only elevates the um, the results. Right. It only elevates the symptoms. as well. I exactly. Mean. You could, yeah, you could hallucinate. You can do any of this stuff. And I'm not saying that this is what happened. I just want to point it out. I just want to put it out there that she had a prescription to Ambien, and during the autopsy, they didn't check for Ambien. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's it's unknown at this at this point if she took it or not. It just... If any type of evidence were to come out that she did take Ambien, it would basically explain the entire thing in my mind. So I just want to put it out there. That is uh, something that you know I've never really seen anyone talk about on any po- any other podcast. They didn't mention it in the documentary that I know of. Right. But it's just something that I think should be known. So let's get on to theories here. I mean, what do you... I mean, you just explained a little bit, but I mean, what do you think could have possibly happened in order for this chain of events to sort of uh, act out the way they did? Well, going through all of my research, going and talking to people on Reddit and other sites about this, and I've sort of, I've tried to figure out what a lot of people think, what the theories are. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people believe that she was a closet alcoholic. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that is probably the most, like like I said, a lot of people believe it. I think it's the most accepted idea because there is no disputing that she was drunk that day. Right. You know, she probably drank at some point in the 45-minute time period between calls from, you know, from her phone to Warren and leaving the gas station. Uh, there were just times that she could have drank. There are times she could have put it in her cup. Uh, there are even times she could have smoked. Sure. I mean, she was on the. Sh- there were people that witnessed her on the side of the highway, uh, acting sick, being sick. And so, what a lot of people believe is, and this is probably the most, you know, what I'm leaning towards, is that she that she was a closet alcoholic. And here's the thing, you know, her personality. For, well, for one thing, statistically, her personality, her exact personality and what happened to her young and how she reacted to that uh, is very high for her to be an alcoholic. And she was also overweight, and she was overweight her entire life, and she had, throughout her entire life, eating disorders, and she could not lose weight. And as you know, I'm sure, just because we have friends that are like this, people that have problems eating – 
mm-hmm. can also have it's very it's very likely that those people can also have problems with other addictions as well. Sure. And drinking is probably the highest one up on that list. Oh yeah. If you eat, if you have an addiction to food, an addiction to fast food or any type of food that makes you gain weight, a lot of those people also have addictions to alcohol. Well, yeah, just any addiction in general, like it's sort of a accepted fact that sometimes when people uh, kick their addictions, they just pick another addiction up. You know, it's certainly possible. Exactly. And also with her personality, she wouldn't have wanted people to know. I mean, her entire family, everyone, her coworkers, all of her friends, everyone knows her to be a super mom, to be a super worker, to be this person that never makes any mistakes. And if she were an alcoholic, I promise you she would not want anyone to know. And the thing about her being a closet alcoholic is we talked about earlier how Diane and Daniel had separate work shifts. Mm -hmm. It would not have been very hard for her to come home, get her children ready for bed while he's sleeping, getting ready for work that he used to be at at 1 o'clock in the morning, and drinking. And even after he leaves or he... You know, if he's just getting ready, it's not, it wouldn't have been very hard for her to keep it hidden. Yeah. And as much as I don't trust Daniel at all, I think that he knows that she drank and did more than he claims. I think he's face to face lying to everyone about it. Same. But even if he is not lying or if he's lying less than we think, it would be very easy for her to conceal uh, her alcoholism from him and from the rest of her family. I agree. I mean, just from my own personal experiences, like people that have drinking problems um, and hide their drinking problems tend to do it pretty easily because, you know, there's not someone on top of you all the time making sure you're doing the right thing. So, yeah, it's pretty easy to hide, at least for um, a lot of people now. I sort of agree with you also that I. I believe she was an alcoholic. I think that's the the most simple sort of uh, way to look at this and be like, oh, well, obviously she was abusing alcohol regardless if she had a history of it or not. That day, she was abusing alcohol and it cost the lives of eight people. And that's something that I really want to go, on, go into as well. During the entire everything this entire case daniel has always said she was not an alcoholic she was right. not drinking she never drank she had to drink occasionally i didn't ever i've never seen her drunk ever and while all of that is probably a lie it does not matter it does not it honestly does not matter if she was an alcoholic or not sure it just doesn't it's like okay she probably was but it doesn't matter. She drank that day. It's like any time he gets on camera or, mi- or or on the microphone, he has to say, well, she's not an alcoholic, therefore right. this couldn't have happened. Yeah, because you you can't be an alcoholic and then, you know, or or not an alcoholic and crash your car when you're drunk. You know, it's exactly. impossible. Yeah, right? He's being sarcastic right here. Yeah. It's like right. yeah, you can't you can't do that. It's like you know, so he so he just assumes that because she was not an alcoholic, and he also he also says he always goes back to this: how during the autopsy there was there were no signs on her liver of alcoholism. Sure. But the thing is, is she was thirty six years old. If unless she had been drinking her entire life, or she had been a very hard drinker for many many years, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case with all alcoholics, yeah. there might not be evidence on her liver to show that she was an alcoholic it's not that cut and dry especially if she hadn't been an alcoholic for very long i love how he uses the evidence like hey her liver was a normal functioning liver but yet he won't accept the fact that her bac was 0.19 it's just it's delusion exactly yeah it's you know it's that's a perfect example you know he yeah he uses this false evidence this this really just you know very circumstantial, not circumstantial, but very it's like... like cherry-picking, essentially. Exactly, he's cherry... Yeah, exactly. He's picking out exactly what evidences he wants to believe in. But the fact that the test results came back twice with that, he won't believe that. Yeah. 
and and it's really it's really sad. And you know, so when we started this dialogue, you know, we were talking about theories, and I said, "Well, I believe that she's a closet alcoholic." The problem that I have with my own idea on that is I don't have an answer for why exactly this happened. You know what I'm saying? Same. I'm right there with you. It doesn't explain why she wouldn't or uh, and really with any of the theories, it doesn't make sense that she would keep driving with all the kids in the car. Like it doesn't if you were drunk, fine, I get it. Um, But if you were having a medical emergency, why wouldn't you just talk to your brother and be honest and have the conversation and be like, hey, come get me. I don't feel safe. I don't know if it's because she didn't want to feel vulnerable. Uh, It's hard to tell. You know, it could come it could come back to the fact that she was known as this super mom and that she couldn't let anyone know that she had been drinking while driving with all these kids in the car. It's really hard to even imagine her starting it. But here's the idea that I have is that maybe she started drinking because she because she thought if I just have one shot, two shots, if I just have a little bit to drink, it'll be okay. I can be fine to drive. For one thing, we've all we've all thought that, right? Right. It's okay. I can be fine to drive. Half of us have done that exactly. And and then, but what happens? You know, maybe what happened was she did that. And then she didn't realize she she didn't realize exactly how much she drank, and she continued drinking. And then by the time she kept drinking, kept drinking, she it's known that she drank all of what all of what she drank in a very short period of time. Right. And the effects that that can have on your body, mix in with the fact that she may have smoked as well at some point during that morning. She definitely did. Exactly. So it's going to just elevate everything all the symptoms she had and so maybe she got to the point where she was basically blackout drunk sure the only real problem i have with this theory again is the fact that she wasn't swerving all around the road she wasn't really driving like a drunk person was driving Mm -hmm. so i don't think that she was really blackout drunk yeah i don't either i think um well and also it's like she she didn't seem like she was driving drunk yet. I mean, she was driving on the wrong side of the road. So I I don't even buy that. You know, I think maybe under careful um, consideration, maybe some people would change their mind and be like, well, I mean, she was she was probably driving like she was drunk. You know, I I don't know. I don't necessarily buy that her driving was all that great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that was just while she was on the – that was really just while she was on – when she was going the wrong direction. Right. I mean, you know, it's said that she wasn't really driving very, quote-unquote, drunk uh, when she was going in the right direction. She was just driving very aggressively. Right. But – you never know exactly how the alcohol affected her and how it sure. affected how she how she would drive. And I it's think. erratic. It's just erratic behavior in general. So regardless if she was drunk or not, we know something was sort of weird. Regardless, was happening. Yeah, exactly. Another theory that I have that possibly could make sense is if. Um, Daniel was not giving us all the information that necessarily happened. He makes it seem to be that the ha- family was as happy as can be. But, you know, I sort of have played with this thought in my head. What if there was um, a conversation that happened between the two before they left the campground that had upset Diane? Now, Yeah, it's, it's definitely plausible yeah and it's it's possible that it could have been a murder suicide in in that way you know um i don't discount it i mean crazier things have happened but it's hard to speculate when um you know you just don't really know well you have all this this opposing evidence it's it's really hard to say it was a murder suicide because because you have all this opposing evidence to say that she was a great mother and a great everything sure. and maybe she snapped maybe she said she had some type of uh, mental delirium some type of mental just right mixed with her prescription or weed or alcohol or anything I mean something could have happened maybe they got into an argument we 
God knows that we that Daniel wouldn't tell us if that happened, you know. So we don't really know, right? And I don't know. The murder suicide thing is kind of weird. Some some people thought maybe, maybe that was it, but I don't really buy it too much, honestly. Right. I think another main theory was that she was just drinking um, to alleviate pain from her tooth. This also sort of fits in line with her going to the gas station and her looking for some sort of pain medication, but instead she leaves, you know, the gas station with nothing, and maybe then, after that, she decides to drink, because up until then, everything seems normal with her. So, maybe that was the case. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't buy this too much. I think, you know, maybe if she was a closet alcoholic and she couldn't get her pain meds and her tooth really was hurting her. Right. And so maybe she did, you know, start to drink at least to alleviate the pain that she was feeling from, uh, you know, from an abscess tooth or any type of toothache that she had. And she did have, uh, I think, a two-month-old abscess tooth, mm-hmm. abscess true tooth, sorry. Right. And that she had never really went to the dentist to take care of. And it was known that she didn't really like doctors or dentists or anything like that. So she wouldn't have went. Um and then maybe it, it you know, kind of goes back to the first theory where if she had this tooth problem, she started drinking to, to sort of get rid of the pain and then and then just kind of spiraled out of control. Right. You know, mixed with the, with the weed and everything. You know, like all of these theories set aside, I think the one thing we can really agree on is that, you know, I think Emma really had it right when, you know, something was definitely wrong with Aunt Diane that day. Um, it's just hard to, to pinpoint exactly what that really was. Yeah. You know, we know that she drank and it's a lot of it is up to, up to, you know, speculation as to why exactly it happened. You go online, you talk to people and I swear to God, everyone has different theories on this. Everyone has a different theory as to why she started drinking and why she drank so much and why this happened in the first place. And so, you know, I hope that we gave the facts. I hope that we didn't miss too much. I don't think that we did. Uh, you know, check out the documentary. There's something wrong with Aunt Diane. Other podcasts, Generation Y being one of them, has covered this case. Check their podcast out. Yeah. I think that there's so much to this case. You can never get enough information. Google search uh, Diane Schuler, Reddit. Look that up. A lot of people have, have had some very interesting conversations about this. And... Um, you know, again, there's just so much to it that, you know, we can only kind of look at the facts and then speculate. All we know is that she drank that day and and she, and she was having some issues. Yeah. And she got on the highway going in the wrong direction and killed seven people and and killed herself as well. If you're listening on YouTube, make sure you leave your theory in the comments. I want to hear it if you have, you know, something maybe we didn't touch on um, or that, you know, we didn't think about. Let us know. Yeah, and again, if you've made it this far, this is our longest podcast. Uh, This is our longest episode so far in this podcast. We're at an hour and 33 minutes. and We didn't necessarily plan this. No. So we're we're leaving this as one episode. I'm not going to split it up because I feel like you need to hear everything at once. And if you're still here with us, you know, just send us an email at the Strangeland Podcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, strangelandpod.com. We're on iTunes, we're on Google Play, Stitcher Radio, basically any podcast app that you have, we should be on it. If we don't, send us an email. I'll try to get us on it. Uh, Spotify should be coming soon in the next couple months. Uh, we're on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Just search uh, the Strange Land podcast on all of those platforms, and we should come up. We have the logo with the bloody hands. And then it says Strange Land on the front as well. That's how you know right, it says. Right. <laughs> Can't miss it. So, Stefan, what are we talking about next week? So next week we talk about a pretty interesting case, one of the youngest serial killers in American history, Harvey Miguel Robinson. Um, should be should be pretty interesting. He's a, he's a character to say the least. Everyone, thank you for listening. Peace out.